colleague and friend, uh, Matt Cook, coming all the way from uh, kind of cool, cooling down New England, uh, Harvard area there. Uh, Matt and I met at the University of Oklahoma where I did a postdoc, and so we started doing work on VR. So you might see a few pictures of me show up in the slideshow. Um, uh, Matt Cook is Digital Scholarship Program Manager at Harvard Library. Uh, he provides instruction, assists in the development of technology spaces, and leads efforts to digitize and explore heterogeneous uh, collections such as text, artifacts, audiovisual materials, while keeping, keeping humans in the loop through the use of augmented and virtual reality interfaces. As a researcher, Matt studies the state and trajectory of digital scholarship more, more broadly, uh, what it takes to manage exploratory, uh, exploratory teams and libraries, and the scholarly impact of new knowledge services related to physical fabrication and mindfulness. I'm very happy to welcome Matt. I hope, hope you can give him a round of applause and give me a little uh, kiss on welcome. We'll save questions to the end. So. Right, so thank you, Zach. Thank you for hosting. Very happy to be here. I've been here a couple times before. I always had a great time. Uh, I have collaborators in the library uh, and in the what is it, Modern Language Humanities Department with Professor Center for Carter. Digital Humanities. Right, so they'll be mentioned again later in the talk. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, obviously, virtual reality and the humanities. Uh, where I'm at at Harvard, we're seeing great demand from all disciplines for virtual reality, specifically for classroom applications. But the problem is, uh, historically, the humanities have been underrepresented, and the content that might power these integrations just doesn't exist, or people aren't aware of where to locate it, how to use it, how to develop it. So we're constantly fielding queries and we're like, okay, we have the equipment, we have the space, we have classrooms. What's the content? What are we gonna show your students? Yes, you wanna do virtual reality, but it's not clear if there's something out there that you can use. So the point of today's talk is to look at some possibilities. So we're gonna focus on content uh, today, next slide. Uh, and we're gonna do it in three ways. We're gonna look at spatial content, narrative content, and textual content. Uh, these are covering a lot of disciplinary ground. If you sort of get it in your head, the different types of content that you can either find or produce, you can support the humanities with virtual reality. You can enhance research and instruction with this technology, which is becoming increasingly popular. popular. People are becoming aware of it. Faculty do want to work with these tools. Uh, and if you're aware of the content that's out there or how to make it, then you can support them. Uh, first, though, we're going to go into background. Each of the background slides is like a talk in itself. So I don't want to get hung up too much on that. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to go into future direction. So textual is the most difficult type of content to visualize. This is basically the tech-centric humanities, history, philosophy, English, literary fiction. These are things that don't have natural analogs in like a visual viewing environment. So this is, we're going to jump off from textual to future directions at the end of the slide. A little bit of background, uh, Zach knows the space. This is the edge makerspace at the University of Oklahoma where we met and started working together. Uh, this is a class, this is a design class, um, and they're doing uh, CAD modeling in virtual reality, so a natural sort of crossover application. You can see back in those days we still needed computers to power our headsets. It's like ancient history in the VR world, basically. Uh, this is where it all started about, around about 2016. 16, we got our hands on the first Oculus development kit, which is like the first time anyone that wasn't in the world of computer science had access to off-the-shelf sort of com computer consumer hardware. Uh, and we started working with that technology. We still work with Oculus. We're not like married to them necessarily, but we can talk about vendors and hardware after the, after the talk slide. Okay, so here's sort of my uh, trajectory. I started actually in the humanities, so this is a talk that's close to my heart. I was a philosophy major, uh, and I, I got my advanced degree in philosophy of mind, specifically, and then began taking those ideas and applying it to research and development concepts in the library. Uh, one example is OVAL, the Oklahoma Virtual Academic Laboratory. So we designed and built these entire hardware software systems, and these are sliding rail chairs, and there's PCs below and behind the user for cable management, there's a 3D mouse in the arm. So these are basically like furniture, VR furniture. We have these all over campus and they were linked up for like virtual classroom applications. Again, these are Oculus powered, desktop powered. Uh, and we had some great curricular integrations. We studied how these impacted learning in the classroom. And that's around the time I started working with Zach. 
uh, and we did at least two big things together. Number one was a grant through IMLS uh, called Lib 3D VR Slide. Uh, and that basically brought together scholars and vendors, sort of private sector entities from around the country. You can see the meeting that we hosted, it was three meetings, so national forums, they called them. One was in Oklahoma, that was Oklahoma there. And basically we got into like the practical considerations of VR in the classroom. So what do you need to move headsets between locations? Uh, how do you source hardware, equipment? Uh, how do you deal with cables, which is less of an issue now, and simulator sickness, which is to a certain extent still an issue, so performance sort of related things. And then how do we preserve virtual reality experiences, which I think is still an open question. Uh, and how do we procure software that helps not just the few STEM majors that we're currently using this technology, but different uh, disciplines, so relevant to today's talk as well. I refer to it as productivity software, it's like multi-use sort of out of the box uh, slide. Another thing that Zach and I did well, and you can see him here pontificating, as he's wont to do, uh, is we would research and write and publish articles on the impact of VR in the classroom. So uh, a lot of our methodologies were sort of self-reported qualitative data, so we kind of hover on this self-efficacy sort of data gathering uh, methodologies. But in the time since, I've worked with scholars and published my own work on a range of different methods for data gathering and measuring the impact of VR in the classroom and for research. So, these are just sort of canonical texts, these references here, and this will be linked in the YouTube video so you can read these for yourself. And then we have our own scholarship, which you can see here. Uh, and I'm happy to say that is seeing an uptake in terms of uh, inroads in the um, scholarly community. So people are beginning to test the impact of the technology, not just in the laboratory, which has been historically the case, but in the classroom as well. So taking the laboratory benefits, uh, taking these research methodologies, and applying them to student, student learning, basically. Slide. And what I've learned sort of over the years and, and some at the end of this background section is that uh, if you combine multivariate data, so big complex data sets that are kind of difficult to view on a 2D screen, on a desktop screen, let's say, and you deploy them in an environment, a viewing environment that has depth of field, so you have a lot of space to work with, and you engage with that content with interfaces that respect the way that your body naturally moves through the world, so this is sort of like a decrease in a learning curve. You put on a headset, you get controllers, you don't have to learn a menu system, you just walk. You just walk through a scene. So that's the idea here. You combine all of this, uh, and there are efficiencies to be gained when it comes to data analysis. And that's just sort of a general benefit of virtual reality across disciplines. Here's the problem, uh, click if you don't mind. Uh, not every discipline has spatial data out of the box, right? This is where the humanities issue comes in. So, okay, we have technology, we have these viewing environments. How do we generate data that helps the humanistic researchers and instructors? Well, there's a few ways to do it. Uh, and we're gonna go into VR content slide, uh, thank you, to find out how. Let's start with spatial content because it's the easiest. Uh, and basically, if you're working with objects of study that are centered on material culture, my shorthand for this is objects, artifacts, and specimens. You can see some examples here. Uh, these are rare special collections, materials, books in our collection that have a certain uh, material quality that is like historically relevant. So the binding in the book, the handwriting in the book, the marginalia, the sort of like uh, wrapping here. These are all sort of relevant to study for some scholars. So the 3D scan is beneficial in that case, even though the text itself could be 2D scanned and read as it is. Uh, this is a specimen from the Museum of Comparative Zoology. They're doing a lot of uh, tomography, micro CT scanning. This is the Museum of the Ancient Near East on the top right. Tons of Egyptian artifacts have been 3D scanned. And I mean tons, there's probably thousands of interactive models on Sketchfab if you get a chance to check that out. Uh, here's some uh, design work we've done in a uh, program called Gravity Sketch. And I mentioned it specifically because it had the sort of cloud support and desktop support that you need to integrate into the classroom. Uh, and then finally, if you're working with like spaces, architecture, buildings, facilities, you can do a Matterport scan and integrate something like that into a virtual reality viewing environment. So these are pretty obvious because they were originally spatial by nature. The object of study exists in the world. You can interact with it, you can photograph it, you can digitize it basically, and then you can put it in a virtual reality. It's like the easiest way to support certain fields, uh, which I'll get into in the slide. And you can produce this content in a 
variety of ways, increasingly um, affordably. Uh, I'm gonna single out photogrammetry here, which is what we do at Harvard Library and our 3D scanning service, uh, which is a process that uses still images in combination and software to create 3D models uh, of increasing resolution. So, but if you start at sort of uh, the smallest scale, and this here is a beetle trachea, so you can get extreme high detail on the smallest objects if you use methods associated with tom tomography, for example. This is not in, as common or affordable in the humanities yet, but there are some crossover grants and applications uh, where humanities researchers are using uh, micro CT scanners to generate content. If you move up to like a tabletop size, you can see photogrammetry I mentioned and then structured light scanning, which is what Jeremy's doing there. That's actually a scale model of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. And I mention it now because that's gonna be the case study that we go on to immediately after this slide. And then sort of moving up to the landscape scale, you have LiDAR flyovers, so you fly your plane and you can map huge landscapes in 3D. And at the cosmic scale, you can generate, uh, this is, represents the collision of a binary star system. So this is NASA-derived supercomputer data that is translated into 3D formats. So you can go from the very small to the very big if your object of study is something that already exists in the world. Like there are methods for this, they're very well documented. Here's what we did uh, in a class, uh, English class, specifically the history of theater, uh, we had a staging Shakespeare uh, experience. So the goal here was to give the students a sense of the scale of perspective of being in the Globe Theater. Now we had a Globe Theater that was crafted to scale, but it was like, you know, tabletop size. So we 3D scanned it in extreme detail and then placed the students in virtual reality on the stage or in the audience so they get a sense of what it's like to be there at that time. Uh, and it was relatively simple, uh, a small class, which really helps. Sketchfab for the viewer, which has VR support. And we use, you can see here, the Quest One headset. So that combination is pretty workable. The class size makes a huge difference. The content was already in the collection and the method for generating the model was photogrammetry, so we knew how to do that as well. So the entire process is pretty well documented and it's reproducible. It's like, okay, here's the benefits and limitations of spatial data for the humanities. It's preservable, and Professor Zach can talk to you about this at length, uh, but the whole point is because these are discrete objects rather than scenes, for example, uh, you can archive them a little bit easier. Um, they're versatile, you can view them on the web, you can view them in virtual reality, you can them on your phone. That's useful. Uh, they're measurable. This is sort of an up-and-coming area. So you can see this is actually the Wright Brothers Wright Flyer. And what's happening here uh, on this screen capture is I took a point-to-point -point measurement of the wingspan and it outputs the actual real-world length of that measurement. So you can do science remotely. If you go to the Smithsonian, they're not going to let you climb on top of the Wright Flyer and take new measurements. You can do this from your home computer because of these qualities that that model has. If you produce them correctly, you can measure them remotely. Uh, here's the limitations. The, the little box here is meant to be like the, the negatives, the downsides. I've noticed over the years of doing this that just having a single object floating in space is not the most exciting thing for an undergraduate to engage with. I mean, this is a pretty cool example. Some of the objects are more interesting than others but it's not like a scene that draws you in. There's not a whole lot of production value in the experience. You're just studying an object, so it's a little boring. Uh, the other issue is not all disciplines are concerned with things that exist in the world, right? The humanities is concerned in many cases with text. None of the things that I mentioned are based in text. They're based in artifacts or objects. So this isn't gonna cover all of the bases. Okay, slide. Let's move on to narrative content. The objects of study here are sort of uh, the gamified movie, high production value experiences that you might see on a platform like Steam, right? So if you're into VR just for gaming, you go online, you can download apps, you can download games. This is the primary like economic driver for the technology. Uh, but if you get into academic settings, you can reproduce historical events, you can reproduce training scenarios. These are basically real world experiences that are translated into virtual reality. They're fully interactive. Theater, dance, and media is another sort of um, shorthand for me. It's just sort of artistic output, artistic experiences. Slide. The production here is like, it's off the high end, you know? Lots of resources, lots of expertise. You can, uh, you can do this sort of work in game design software, Unity, Unreal, Godot. You can do motion capture. You can do 360 and volumetric video. 
these are basically like Hollywood style productions at their at their highest end, right? You can do obviously guerrilla filmmaking methods in this way, but you're still going to need, you know, principal photography, post production. You're going to need a staff. You're going to need resources. You're going to need photographic equipment. You're going to need sound. All right. So you can see how this would all add up if you're producing content for class. Next slide. Here's something we did in this area. Uh, you can kind of get a sense here. This involved a bunch of Parisian characters. These are real people and they filmed their life. They had a 360 camera. They filmed their life for a week, going to the cafes, going to their apartments, going to the art museum, living life as they would live uh, in France, in Paris specifically. So the idea here was give the students, uh, our language students in French language and culture, an experience of what it was like life on the ground. Uh, and this is 360 video. So it's more realistic than some of the um, you know, cartoonish graphics or 3D scans. It has all of the sort of background characters because you're like city life, right? You hear the trains moving, you hear the garbage trucks, all that stuff. This, we went as far as doing in, uh, original research. You can read the principal investigator here is Nicole Mills. Again, in our romance literature, uh, romance languages department, she's a, the French uh, instructor that led this course and continues to lead it. Uh, this is one example of a sort of higher production value, photorealistic, 360-degree video output slide. Benefits and limitations. Uh, I like to invoke a extremely detailed um, interactive experience here, Titanic VR, because I think it does a great job demonstrating both the, the strengths and the weaknesses of this type of content. Uh, you can make these into fully interactive video games. And what student isn't going to want to like do that as part of their class, right? So they're super engaging, these content. They're gamifiable. You can have goals, you can have objectives, you can have tasks. They're super immersive because you can have voice actors acting out the parts in the game and make them interactive. And they're visually rich. There's not just a single object on the screen here, right? For example, there's the whole scene. Uh, these are extremely expensive to produce and they're scripted, and the script involves a certain, in this case, a certain historical event. So unless you're a history teacher teaching about the Titanic or the time period, that's not gonna be a very useful experience for more than a single day of class. It's just like a limited application for all of the work and money that goes into it. Slide. All right, let's move on to textual content. So get, this is sort of the meat of it. Uh, you know, the humanities, as I know them, are text-centric, and the source material is and exists in articles and monographs, right? These are, this is the stacks of the library. This is the books and the articles. This is like the meat of the humanities. Uh, there's also bibliographic sort of mapping you can do on top of those materials, and then you can even go one step higher uh, and map the scholarly, scholarly network, the experts, and what they're producing and how they're related. So this is a, a colleague of ours, Adam Anderson, who was formerly at Harvard, now at UC Berkeley. He's doing uh, network graphing of scholarly networks related to, I believe it's Assyrian uh, language um, research. So this is uh, ancient language research and scholarly networks associated with them. This sort of content can be deployed in 3D and in virtual reality, right? Specifically the scholarly networks. Slide. The production of this sort of experiences, these text-centric virtual reality experiences, is still very new and experimental. There's a paper here that I'd recommend checking out, but you kind of get the idea. It's sort of a virtual desktop, tabletop, where you have all of these texts sort of floating in space. So you can get into the full text, you can get into the source material, and you can read in virtual reality, and you can lay out a lot of documents, right? You can kind of set up your workspace how you want. Uh, one way to do that today without going into this research project is big screen VR, so that's an application. If you're looking at scholarly networks, which I mentioned, you can do network graphing in VR using a tool called Virtualytics, uh, and we do so. And then the closest thing we have now to sort of full text uh, visualization for this sort of source material is what I think of as transduction. So we're going to interpret and change the contents of a text and make it into something that is visual. This is an interpretive process. Slide. Here's an example of what I mean. We had a class centered on Dante, and I'll just read the quote first because I think it's relevant. This is from the Inferno Canto One. In the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood where the direct way was lost. It is hard to think, thing to speak of, how wild, harsh, and impenetrable the woods was, so that thinking of it rec recreates the fear. That is the 
etching, engraving from the illustration associated with this canto in Dante. That was made into a virtual reality scene for the students in class. They were able to inhabit the deep dark woods that Dante mentions. So this text was transcribed, transmuted into a scene that sort of gives you the feel, the atmosphere of the words, but it's not every word perfectly transcribed, right? So this is a really, really compelling experience. And it's just a static scene. You just look around, but it has like the, you know, the sounds of the forest. It has like the darkness is well conveyed. You can see the students there that were looking at it. So this is again, humanity's text that was transduced into a visual form, but it's just an interpretation, which I think is the big issue here, slide. So again, we're, we have endless source material if we're talking about text-centric humanities. I mean, the library is filled with collections that we could use if we knew how to visualize them in this way. Uh, and it impacts multiple disciplines. Uh, you know, there's not a humanities discipline I know that doesn't have or make use of some te text in some form. And you can do some mapping sort of at the higher level, the bibliographic and scholarly network level, using immersive scatter plots, which I'll, I'll talk about again in a second. But the problem when you get into sort of the Dante type visualization, and it's this interpretation of the text. It's not a representation or you know, an exact replication of the text. Someone made that illustration, and they took the words and they made it, but it's not exactly what Dante wrote, right? So that's an issue. You can't do close reading on an interpretation. It's not the text as it is. Okay. Here's where we start thinking about the future and ways to get into close reading uh, and visualization of these texts. Thank you, Zach. So here, a little stepping back again, sort of a side path, and then we'll, we'll loop back. Uh, the background you'll remember was Oklahoma. This is the, the new program at Harvard Library. It's the Digital Scholarship Program. Concerns a lot of 3D data management, which shouldn't be surprising given the topic of today's talk. I mentioned 3D scanning. That is a service uh, that is new, but very promising, and we support a lot of disciplines with that work. Immersive analytics, I mentioned, is sort of data visualization in VR. That's the uh, scatterplot sort of generation. Uh, and then printing and preservation, printing as in 3D printing, so the same data that goes into the scanning service or into a viewer in the headset can be 3D printed in many cases. And then preservation, which is an area that Zach and I are constantly talking about and working on. Now, we also administer services. Uh, we administer services that are not 3D related, so this is an open science framework, uh, institutional membership that we maintain. I have a service for web authoring, so website building. Uh, free service, that's uh, Reclaim Hosting, if anyone's familiar with that, it's like a WordPress uh, multi-site system. We have the virtual um, architectural designs that I showed a little picture of earlier, so 3D scanning of facilities, and I'll get into this in a minute. A lot of OCR, so uh, transcription of printed words, and then HDR is handwriting transcription, so handwritten document transcription if people are working with that source material. I would say the main thing I do uh, is faculty technology consulting, and that breaks down in different ways. Uh, innovation spaces is like how do you build out a new lab, kind of like what Zach is doing here, with you know new equipment, and how do you get people in and out, and how do you host office hours, and what sort of events are a good fit. Grant writing and development, again, something Zach and I collaborate on regularly. Uh, and then instructional support, here's an example of that. Again, you can find the reference in the YouTube video if you want to read the article. Uh, that is a class that I'm very proud of because we've got something like 200 chemistry students uh, in and out of headsets over the course of a week uh, during class time. So they were looking at chemical molecules and virtual reality. I think it was organic chemistry is the exact class. You can read all about it in the article right there. Uh, slide. As part of the consulting, I've been fielding more and more questions related to the sort of subtopic that I think of as corpus analysis. So people will come to me with collections uh, like the ones described here or mentioned here, uh, and they'll have these, they'll share these characteristics. Oftentimes they'll have different media associated with them. So there'll be some books, there'll be some articles, there'll be some handwritten documents, there'll be some diary entries. They're kind of quasi-digital in the sense that there may be an image of the text, but not a full text transcription, so they're hard to study. So maybe you've seen this a lot. You go online, you find the text, but then you can't like, you can't keyword search it, let's say. And they're huge collections tens of thousands of novels in some cases that need to be analyzed but that aren't transcribed and they're in a very raw format. Adding to that, the people that are requesting this don't necessarily code or know how to deploy automation techniques to study these documents. 
So this is the two characteristics of this corpus analysis activity, which is sort of increasingly common in what I do. So I, the first part of this process, when I get you know a request like this, is to look at tools related to transcription. There's a lot of this. It's getting better and more accurate. Uh, you can toggle the threshold for how accurate you want your outputs to be, and then publish that as part of the output, so people know if it's accurate or not. Sort of a side note. Uh, one example of a good tool that's available right now on GitHub, which is open source, is a throughput tool for handwriting transcription called uh, Handwrite. Not surprisingly. Uh, Mike Hucka, Hucka at Caltech developed and deployed this tool. Uh, it still requires that you connect it to one of these major transcription services, but you can feed it thousands of documents and get the, trans the plain text transcriptions back uh, pretty quickly. So you hook up to Microsoft, as we've done. Uh, you get back the JSON data associated with like orientation and placement of individual words, as well as the confidence in the result. Uh, and you also get the annotated image with the transcription and the plain text transcription from a tool like uh, Mike Hucka's handprint slide. Once you have the transcriptions and you collate them, you can spell correct and begin doing keyword searches or fuzzy keyword searches and drilling down into the corpus if you know what you're looking for, right? If you know there's going to be some sort of concept that's going to appear, you can begin to search once the data comes out of the transcription phase. Then you can deploy natural language processing techniques, which many of you will be familiar with, and start generating uh, frequency charts associated with keywords. You can do name entity recognition. You can do sentiment analysis and stylistic analysis. You can geolocate tokens in the text, which is very exciting. All of these are possible now on desktop. But what if you start thinking about full text transcriptions in virtual reality slide? Well, here's an example of what I mean. Uh, another quote, this time from Professor Zaret, who's studying Shun, which is Yiddish pulp fiction. These narratives, sensationalist as they may be, helped shape the Jewish encounter with modernity. They were the stories of Jew Jewish migrants took with them as they marginalized diaspora community into new urban environments, even into new languages. So I mentioned 10,000 novels. This is the Shun collection. It's sort of, as I said, quasi-digital. What Professor Zaret is doing here in our visualization lab is looking at a sort of bibliographic analysis that takes into account the type of novel and the authorship. So there were themes that persisted across time or entered at different times, sort of uh, types of novels, uh, if you will, comical novels, poetic novels, these sorts of designations. So he's looking at these categories. And I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually a timeline here, a publication timeline. So you can look at thousands of novels and how they were classified over time and their authorship. Who was a prolific author during the, you know, the phase of printing in New York in 1932, and what sort of novels were they publishing? What he can't do, and what it wouldn't make sense for him to do in this like, viewing environment here, is to read the text of those novels. Because I mean, these are just points floating in space, right? These are not words. He's not going to click on those and see what the author was actually writing about. He might have a sense of the genre, but he can't read the text. So that's the problem. That's what we're trying to solve now. Uh, and that will be slide. Uh, possible with a tool called Longhand. And what I'm going to show you here is the throughput diagram of a new piece of software that we've been developing uh, in partnership with some students uh, and in consultation with SAC. Uh, the way this starts is as I described with a transcription phase and then a natural language processing phase. But then instead of stopping there and looking at, say, a limited number of thematic outputs, we can transcribe this prevalence map into a 3D scene that queries the Sketchfab 3D asset database to build a virtual reality environment populated with the terms in the text. You see what I'm saying? So if it says here, heart, face, hand, you use the Sketchfab API to find models that reference those objects, and then you build a scene with virtual reality capabilities that you can walk through explore in 360 degrees. You can take out a lot more information, as I mentioned, a lot quicker. It's a very efficient way to look at a lot of text. So we're going from raw input to VR scene, and the contents of that scene come from a huge asset database, and they're informed by the prevalence of certain terms. Slide. Here's some tests that we've had, early tests. This works really well with like inventories. This is the, I believe this is a Freedom of Information Act request. This is the contents of the evidence locker in McLennan County, Texas. 
So these are just random data sets that are available that represent objects that you can use to populate a scene. This is the Army Cookbook from 1920. This is the History of Man and Religion, published in something 1927, I think it is. So these are all open access data sets that we threw into the system, query the Sketchfab API, build out these virtual reality environments. Works really well for a variety of different types of tags, specifically inventories, I've noticed. Uh, cookbooks work really well, and then to a limited extent, fiction and prose, if you drill down. Slide. Uh, there are benefits here. So I mentioned full text input, which is not currently super capable or super possible when it comes to visualization of humanities data. We also have this huge 3D asset repository that we're pulling from, which is Sketchfab. So if you hook up to Sketchfab via the API, you have access to hundreds of thousands of models immediately that you can begin downloading to populate the scene. Uh, and then we can talk about this offline. Uh, it's easier to take in um, 3D objects in 360 degrees than it is to take in words because you can rotate the objects in arbitrary positions and still recognize them as instances of their self, but you can't rotate the text in any orientation or direction. Sort of getting into the weeds, we can talk about that later uh, slide. Obvious limitations with this tool is that you first have to generate the plain text and you have to pay to use Microsoft, Google, Amazon to get the text out of the raw material. The other thing is it's not super clear how to place the objects in a 3D scene because you have size of object, you have distance from the viewer, you have rotation, you have orientation, you know, you have 360 degrees of sandbox, of play space to work in. How do you place what where and what is the relationship between the objects in the scene? The other thing is when you get into abstract concept, concepts, and you start pinging Sketchfab with something like, um, uh, like a verb, like run. You're gonna get like something random, like uh, who knows, a car engine that was running at the time they did the 3D scan. There's all this ambiguity when you get into non-noun, non-entity visualization, which is definitely a limitation of the tool. That's the GitHub link, by the way, and that'll be in the YouTube video as well. So here's where we're going next. You know, based on those uh, limitations, we're putting a team to work. These are my students that I'm working with at UC Berkeley as part of a semester long digital scholarship, or sorry, data science discovery program. They're gonna focus on two things. Get out of the sort of coding environments that allow uh, only technical people to benefit from longhand and build like a web app where you can drag and drop your text into virtual reality, basically. So make a front end for longhand. The other thing is start thinking about researching, testing the Z layer, which is how to place objects basically in the Z dimension. And then this is pretty amazing. In the last like two or three weeks, we've seen at least three research teams publish on uh, text to 3D using AI. This is super common if you're familiar with like stable diffusion, text to 2D image output, like image generation with AI. Now they're doing text to 3D. So you can imagine you feed, instead of going to Sketchfab and it's kind of like, okay, hit or miss, but I'm gonna hit. Uh, I'm gonna give them my full text and the computer is gonna generate new models based on the input text data. And then you build array. So right now all of these teams are generating single models. Uh, imagine if they were able to output huge like sets of models and then deploy those in virtual reality. That's the sort of future of this tool, I believe. All right. All right, so let's wrap things up and then we'll have some questions. Thank you, Zach. So here's some takeaways in terms of content type. This is what's good about spatial content. It's discrete. You can separate out objects. You can preserve them. Uh, you can deploy them on multiple platforms. It's relatively inexpensive photogrammetry. All you need is software and a still image camera. You can use your iPhone for that. But it's field limited. It only applies to disciplines where the object of study is spatially extended by nature. Here, the narrative content is both engaging and photorealistic in many cases, but it's extremely expensive to produce. Textual content is huge, like very promising, great potential, versatile because it applies to almost every discipline, but still very experimental, you know, which is a limitation, okay? So here's how I'd recommend proceeding. Uh, if you're a scholar, if you're an instructor, if you're a researcher, look first at what you're studying and work backwards. Think about the objects that are in your curriculum or in your research program and work backwards from there. Don't try to you know, change everything you're doing to fit into virtual reality, right? Then provision or produce the content to align with your object of study based on some of the concepts that we talked about today. And then finally, this is probably the easiest thing, is there are people doing this at U of A. 
So for example, Catalyst has technology that can help you do this and expertise. Uh, Brian Carter, Dr. Carter is Center for DH. He's doing amazing work with volumetric video, for example. That's a great place to go to and, and talk to. And then Zach in the iSchool here in the building is here to talk about these things as well. So this is how I would recommend moving forward uh, if and when you're ready to mm -hmm. begin visualizing text, visualizing objects of study that come from the humanities in virtual reality. Thank you.